This is the WGNS Action Line, talking with Rutherford County newsmakers about what matters most to you. Now your host, Scott Walker. In studio with us this morning, we have Joey P. from Murphy's Bro Medical Clinic. And uh, Joey, you are the president there and CEO and Man, you've been there a long time. I have, Scott. Uh, before before we get much into this, I just wanted to shout out your good neighbor of the day selection, Donna Jaco. She was literally a good neighbor of mine through most of my childhood. She and her she lived in the next door to where I grew up, out in Halls Hill, and uh, she is a wonderful lady and great choice there for for good neighbor of the day. That's cool. You, you know, when you talk about stuff like local media, the cool thing about it is they talk about people you know I, I mean local residents that's exactly right but uh yeah i've i've been at uh murfreesboro medical clinic for a little over 26 years uh, i've been the ceo since 2003 so uh i've seen a lot of change in the organization over those 26 years and i've been fortunate to lead the organization through many of them how have you facilitated such growth because a, a lot has changed over the years you've been there from of course moving the clinic that was one of the most major moves that was done i guess in the clinic's history well they, they joke uh, scott that medical group ceos have three never events that uh, they can do in their career and keep their job and one of them's build a building and, and I've done that about four times now. Uh, I actually have a couple more projects uh, in the works, but it was the foresight of our physician leadership to understand with uh, what Murfreesboro and Rutherford County are going through on a growth front that we as a medical community and the leading physician organization in Rutherford County needs to try our best to stay ahead of that growth curve. Uh, sometimes we've been successful, other times we haven't, but uh, it's, it's difficult to find new physicians. The glut of physicians in that retirement age uh, and, and some of the demands on what, what it's like to practice as a physician now has caused some of them to retire early and trying to replace those physicians when you have a physician shortage in the country is, is a challenge. But uh, we've uh, found some great docs over the past few years and had them had them join us and be very successful here. When Murfreesboro Medical Clinic moved from North Highland, which is where Murfreesboro Police are now, right. but when they made that move from there to Medical Center Parkway and, and that whole gateway area, did you ever envision the growth that you have seen? Because, for example, MMC on South Church at, at Volunteer Road and then the one out there at West Lawn, those are the sizes of almost what MMC once was on North Highland. You're exactly right. Uh, we had the the police station that they, uh, uh, our old clinic that they renovated substantially was 120,000 square feet. In 2008, we opened the first uh, phase of our building out in the Gateway area there on Garrison Drive. It was 75,000 square feet. In 2013, when we relinquish the facility on Highland and moved into the second phase of Garrison Drive. Uh, that was another 150,000 square feet. So we, we picked up about 30,000 uh, more uh, square feet of capacity. And, and then in 2019, we opened that first building on South Church Street, uh, Shelbyville Pike, and that was 30,000 more square feet. Our physicians get to the point where they're bumping into each other in, in our existing space and necessitating the need for the additional uh, the additional square footage just to be able to expand. At the same time, I don't know that anybody would say we've got just the most amazing traffic situation in, in Murfreesboro and Rutherford County to where, you know, when you and I were growing up, you could get across town in 10 minutes. And uh, now, it, now it may take you 10 minutes to turn left uh, against traffic going uh, up uh, South Church. So the ability to put some facilities in areas of the community that make it more convenient for patients to be seen closer to where they are. Uh, that's some of the um, best compliments we've gotten with South Church and now that we brought Westlawn on last fall. It's actually been open about a year this month and bringing it online again enabled people to seek care in their community a little bit more so and that's that's ultimately our plan for Las Casas out on the east side of town. Now in Las Casas are you going to build a structure similar to the one that, which is near uh, Veterans Parkway and Shores Road or is it going to be closer to the size of the one off 231 South? It, it'll be closer to the South Church location on, on Shelbyville Pike. Uh, the, I mentioned the 
Uh, Shelbyville Pike location is uh, 30,000 square feet. Uh, right now, the plans are for Las Casas to be a little bit larger than that. Still two-story. It will look very similar in, in appearance to uh, what the South Church location appears. And about when do you think construction will start on that one? Still to be determined. Uh, to some degree, as my father-in-law used to say, we're letting the goose refeather a little bit. But uh, looking at maybe a spring of next year, groundbreaking. Uh, we do have uh, plans that are should see some activity out adjacent to our Shores Road facility out there in the West Lawn area. And uh, we have a secondary building that is going up out there about 30,000 square feet. Now, it will not have the same appearance as the other main MMC locations is it's going to be more uh, a third party rental space for medical office tenants. Okay. Uh, so we're pretty excited about, about it coming online. It should be ready early 2026, late 2025, if we can have some suitable weather for construction. How much has medicine changed or, or maybe the the practice of medicine changed since you first started at MMC? Oh, it was, how long's this show? Uh, in, in all seriousness, Scott, uh, the, the transition to what is now the practice of medicine, not just in Rutherford County, but nationwide. I, th I think in 1998, when I started with the clinic, uh, one of our largest departments was our medical records department. We had all these sliding shelves and things where if you had an appointment, we had to get that list and pull your chart and get it to the doctor's office so he or she could have access to your medical record. In 2004, uh, there was a push to get all the records digitized. So if you find a physician's office now that still runs on paper charts, it's, uh, it's, it's really a, a unicorn and, or maybe even a dinosaur. Uh, there, some physicians would say we've taken a step back uh, because of the computerization of the records maybe gets between the physician and the patient at times. But uh, that's one, uh, the level of documentation, box clicking, uh, clicks on a mouse and things to go through uh, has added administrative burden on physicians to get their documentation done to where Previously, you know, some brief notes could be written to document that that visit, especially some some rechecks and things. But now, the uh, burden that insurance companies and Medicare uh, entities like that from the outside are necessitating on some of the documentation is creating some issues, large incidents of burnout in in physicians in medicine in is general. Is there a logical reason why these insurance companies want the doctors to fill out more paperwork? Uh, well, if you look at um, some of the news articles that have been in uh, in the press recently about Medicare Advantage plans and uh, switching from fee-for-service to value-based uh, care where insurance companies will send nurses, maybe even a physician, into a patient's home to assess that patient. And based upon the diagnoses that they may be able to identify without having seen a physician, they submit those and, and additional monies come to them, thus raising their revenue and then having the physicians control the cost as best they can. It's, it's a revenue play. But uh, on a lot of those, it's filling out questionnaires on patients, uh, stuff like that to identify maybe previously undiagnosed conditions that those patients have. How often do you hear from patients who say, you know, I've got private insurance and I'm at a point where I almost can't afford that insurance anymore? It is uh, it is a real situation. And, and I say that from the standpoint of we're not just a recipient of insurance payments when you come see us, we are a consumer of insurance for our staff members as well. And when we are going through the renewal process, our, our plan renews in May of every year. So we're going through, we'll start this process in January, February for a May renewal. And what we're seeing is you know, seven, eight, 10% trend increases on our insurance costs. Now, what I can tell you is those costs are being driven largely by a lot of the new biologics, uh, drugs, pharmaceuticals. Uh, it's not flowing back to physicians uh, by and large, but uh, the drivers of healthcare costs uh, you're, you're, you're seeing, I think 
everybody listening to us this morning have experienced some type of inflationary pressures over the past several years. Healthcare is no different because of all of the costs related to that. Uh, it's just a matter of how can uh, the, the revenues that physicians get keep up with the costs that, that are incurring that everybody's seeing, whether it be electricity, whether it be, like I mentioned, the drugs and medicines. But uh, it's something about our staff members. They won't raise this too, right? <laughs> they, they do. <laughs> Again, Joey P. with us this morning from Murphy's Murfreesboro Medical Clinic. Feel free to text us any questions you may have, 615-893-1450. Was the biggest driver for increased cost, was, was that because of COVID or did this increase in cost start to spike before COVID? What I would say in in response to that, Scott, is in in the 20 years pre-COVID, I would say from 98 to about 2020, medical inflation and inflation for that matter was mild. Uh, Cost increased slightly, but nothing out of the realm of reasonableness. COVID hits and you have the labor force shrink greatly. Healthcare, we sent some people home to work remotely, but you know, I, I, I joked that uh, in one of our family texts, I had some brother-in-laws and nieces and all these family members texting their fuzzy slippers and their pajama pants working from home. And on the way out uh, that afternoon, I stop and take a picture of our COVID drive up testing tents and say, hey, we could use some help if, if somebody wants to get out. But uh, that really threw a, a monkey wrench into the staffing situations where travel nurses became a big thing. Nobody could find nurses and thus hospitals were in desperate need. So they start hiring LPNs as opposed to RNs. And then next thing you know, we're competing with hospital systems for CNAs and MAs. And that's all driving up that wage growth, uh, especially on those uh, uh, intensely trained medical skill sets, RNs, uh, ultrasound techs, uh, things like that, that uh, just you you and I just can't walk into a room and start doing that. The, the specialized training that they receive, uh, that created it. And then you have the supply cost you can't get. We're, we're in a situation right now with um, fluids that are used in surgeries, uh, a lot of um, IV bags and things. One of the facilities that makes a substantial portion of those is over i think it's in western north carolina that was destroyed by the uh, by the hurricane so hospitals our ascs uh, are on allotments that may see some rescheduling of elective surgeries because we can't get the supplies because of that so all of those shocks to the system we've had since COVID hit in early 2020 are real. They're cost drivers that uh, are substantial. And then you look at the revenue side. I think everybody that's gone to McDonald's, I heard something on the news last night that went to get a hamburger and it's $15. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. Well, uh, the 25, 35% of your business is 10 care, Medicaid, and then Medicare. Uh, I don't think the politicians are too inclined to increase reimbursements to to medical providers uh, when politics everybody's talking about you know Medicare's going broke all those things so it's a it, it's a tough situation to be in medicine right now Scott how much harder is it to hire a new doctor at MMC today versus let's say ten years ago well hard is um, hard's a little bit of a misnomer first I've got to identify them and. If I can get them to come visit, I stand a pretty good chance of getting them signed, Assume, assuming all the personality and training and things that you would think about when you're you're interviewing for a position anyway. Well, when you say come visit, where are they coming from? Uh, all over. Uh, we, we had a um, vascular surgeon come visit a couple weeks ago. He's currently in Atlanta. And uh, then we've got another one. He grew up. Uh, he's coming this week. Uh, he grew up in the Clarksville area, but he's finishing his training, I think, up at Michigan State. Uh, one of the things you see when you're recruiting physicians is they typically will select a practice site within 50 to 100 miles of where they either grew up, th- them or their spouse, or where they trained. Makes sense. So we've gotten a few that have come back that 
Murfreesboro was their hometown with the residency program here at St. Thomas Rutherford. We've gotten some physicians from, from that program, but typically it's, uh, it's where close to where they trained or close to where they or their spouse grew up. Uh, you, you would also see though, the difficulty becomes like a vascular surgeon. Uh, we had our third one retire what's coming up on three years ago. And it's taken us three years to replace them just because they're not churning out that many. And when you have those physician retirements, it just becomes a challenge. That's what I'm saying. If I can find them and get them here, what's not to love about the community? You know, you think the state yeah. is a no income tax state. Uh, it's a great place to live. You, you have the benefits of being close to, to Nashville, Davidson County with sports and entertainment and all of those things. It's got a nice airport that you can fly anywhere in the world typically with no more than one connecting flight. And, and so it's a nice community to recruit to. You think of some of the other places around that it may be less enticing. You know, yeah. it's, not a, it's not a slap against Jasper, Tennessee, but if you've driven to Chattanooga, they've got a nice hospital right there next to the interstate, but it's Jasper. Yeah. You know, they, they don't have those same amenities to offer that, that Murfreesboro and Rutherford County does. So I guess part of the problem is th- there's not – maybe enough doctors graduating right now from colleges universities all across the country there, there's not enough doctors graduating from specialty programs i mean that's part of the problem that, that, that's some of it uh they have there has not been an increase in residency slots in a while uh and and i it's been a while since i've seen the statistics on residency slots that have gone unfilled but it's it, it's a challenge with uh finding those physicians just the numbers retiring that have been in practice 30, 40 years, and having a, a younger generation coming out of training. It was, I, I forget, 10 or 15 years ago, they changed the amount of hours. They reduced the amount of hours that physicians could train during the residency programs. They, they cut it back a lot. And, and so that's just one better lifestyle choices for the physicians, but it's also created just a little bit of a challenge from a hey, I've got to do whatever we can to, to take care of uh, of all my patients. There's just fewer and fewer of them. Are there fewer private practice doctors out there today? Well, the days where a physician came out of residency and rents a little office and hangs out his own shingle, th- those are substantially gone. Uh, what I've seen is now there is a growing trend of fewer and fewer independent physician groups. Uh, currently, the, the statistics I saw at a conference in the last couple of weeks, 77% of the physicians in this country are employed by hospitals, health systems, or the new entrant into the market is private equity firms. Uh, I, so, I was surprised by that because you said that off the air, and I had never heard that. that that's very different to say the least. Yeah, uh, the private equity firms are looking for return and they, they see physician practices, especially those, uh, something like dermatology, uh, radiology, uh, GI, but now they're getting into kind of our space in the multi-specialty group, but they will come in and they will buy the group and then look for ways to increase the profitability of that group. At some point, they, uh, they may roll those up with other groups and then maybe even sell them to a larger private equity firm. Uh, there, there's been a lot of angst in the anesthesia market. Uh, there was a large group rolled up out of Texas uh, that's actually gotten some Justice Department interest in, in some of their activities. So, you know, it's not always good, especially for, for patients. When patients are looking for physicians, as, as I've been told, the most expensive piece of medical equipment in medicine is the physician's pen. And then when you look at the at a hospital, a hospital cannot control, cannot create one dollar of revenue, except maybe in its gift shop or cafeteria without a physician's signature on an order. So uh, where those physicians practice and who employs that physician is, is key. So I'm, I'm a huge proponent of our fiercely independent medical group, and that's, that's what I would tell physic- people when they're seeking a physician or receiving care, are they independent? Yeah. And, and is it obvious? You know, as a patient, I guess one of my bigger concerns would be when I go to this doctor's office, is this doctor going to be there for me 
over the next 10 to 20 years, maybe even 30, 40 years, are they going to be the same doctor I continue to see? And I'm sure that's a, a question patients ask when they go to a doctor at MMC. Well, we have we have a good track record in bringing in physicians and having them stay for a long time. Now, there's a few that, for whatever reason, don't work out. That's that's true in any organization. I'm sure you've hired an employee in the past, Scott, that you know thought they were going to be just just the real deal and they come in for whatever reason doesn't work out you know our our model may not be right for some physicians but by and large the physicians that we recruit and bring in are with us for a long time so you do have that consistency of of care especially with a lot of the new physicians now 75 years that's how long mmc has has been around 75 years this year yes we, that, that's a long time we found it in uh, 1949 it's a uh, great thing how many businesses don't even make it five years and and to think about what doctors carl adams and sc garrison started in 1949 is still uh, flourishing here in in murfreesboro now how is mmc owned is it owned by a group of doctors by investors what what does that look like it is owned by the physicians so the men and women you see running around in the white coats and scrubs at, at mmc are the owners and and so when we say we're independent, we are we are absolutely independent. I, I tell all of our new employees uh, that the physicians are the owners, and what that means is we're not having to send off to some ivory tower in Chicago or New York or, or Nashville or anywhere else for decisions. The decisions are made locally to treat our patients locally. Uh, I, I jokingly say these are my friends, my family, and my neighbors that are coming to the clinic. You know, Knowing Donna Jaco for 50, 58 years is one of those things growing up here. I've got a little different perspective on that decision-making process and keeping it local. That's got to make a big difference. It makes it a whole lot easier for me from a motivation standpoint to say, what can we do to improve the health of the people of Rutherford County? And when you see you know, continued expansions happen you know, throughout Rutherford County, how big of a role do these physicians play in saying, you know, hey, we, we really need to locate a new building here, wherever that may be? Well, I think the, the biggest thing is their willingness to continue to expand because the source of capital for building those buildings is is our physician owners. Uh, they're raising the money. They're the ones signing on the on the notes for the, the mortgages for those. Uh, they're the ones taking the risk. So it's huge. But at the same time, their willingness to grow and recruit is 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 also huge. Uh, the I, I, I forget what the catalyst was, but I'd been here probably 12 or 15 years. And our internal medicine department had nine physicians when I started, okay? 10 or 12 years in, we had nine physicians in that department. And so it got to the point where they realized that that was not sustainable. And so we've grown that department for primary care, uh, adult primary care. And I think there's 24 internal and family medicine physicians as part of our group. I'm interviewing two in the next, uh, I got one coming in I think on the 17th or 18th 19th excuse me the 19th and then another one um, early Jan uh, excuse me early December uh, to, to start next summer so again still trying to do that uh, but yeah 75 years of growth uh, it's 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 been an interesting ride the, the 26 years that I've been there I can imagine a, a whole lot of growth and a lot of expansion, new buildings. I, I mean, it's it's changed a lot. Well, it, I, I kind of joke if you've been in our main office there on Garrison Drive, the first floor between phases one and phase two, uh, we've got uh, photographs of all of our, all of our physicians, and then to think that there are I think eight that have been there as long or longer than I have. And to see that growth of, of all the physicians that we've been able to, to bring in and, and help become this medical community. Uh, you, you ask about the goal when we moved to, to Garrison Drive. We, we had a plan to get to 100 physicians. Well, we hit that goal this year. It's a little later than we thought we would because you take, you know, add three and one doesn't work out, so you're back to two, and it just – took us a little longer but but that's a key we have a little over 100 physicians now and continuing to grow 
amazing and the growth that you've seen is amazing just like rutherford county has grown i mean we're looking at soon 400,000 residents in rutherford county well i i said on this on, on your airways before if the numbers are right 25 29 people a day moving to rutherford county every hundred days that's let's just say on the low end 2500 people i pray one of them's a physician because that is a new physician practice on the upper end so when so when you think about that 25 people a day 2500 over roughly three months that's three thousand times four so you're talking ten thousand people a year Uh, that's that's four or five new adult primary care practices or four or five new physician practices so is there an average recommended number per 1,000 residents? How many doctors you should have? Uh, th- there are. I don't follow those. I just I, I look and see what our needs are and how long it takes for you to call in and get a new patient appointment. Again, Joey P. with us this morning, president and CEO of Murfreesboro Medical Clinic. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be right back. You can text us any questions you may have, 615-893-1450. The Action Line on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna. Listen and watch at WGNSRadio.com. What I like to think about Adam's Place is it's sort of a pipeline. Alan Butcher. You enter in at the independent living end of it and you go as far as you can. It just happens that my wife is in the memory unit. So I'm able to go over and see her each day, and that works out real well. Hi, this is Terry Deal at Adams Place. Call me for more information about Adams Place. Phone 615-904-9111. Adams Place on Memorial, across from Walmart. You know, gift cards are always the easiest gift. This is Peter Demas at Demas' Restaurant. We will buy gift cards and just kind of have them on hand. They're amazing gifts to give to teachers. If you want to give a gift at your workout groups, you know, you have a personal trainer, family members. It's great to give gifts for 16, 17, 18 years old who are just now beginning to date and they need to be able to have some place to take someone on a date to. Gift cards are always the easiest gift. Demas's Restaurant on Northwest Broad Street. Hi, this is Amanda from Animal City, inviting your family to come do business with my family. Most of us know to buckle up to protect ourselves in the car. Did you know you can offer your pet the same type of protection with a Ruffland kennel? This time of year, we usually look to vacation. If you're traveling with your pet, keep them safe in a Ruffland kennel. Here at Animal City, we are a Ruffland dealer. Come in and see us and get your pets some protection. Animal City, 919 Northwest Broad Street here in Murfreesboro. We're excited to announce that Capstar Bank is now officially a division of Old National Bank. The friends you've made while banking right here over the years are still here. And so are those delicious, warm, homemade cookies. Everything you enjoyed about Capstar is still at Old National Bank. In Murfreesboro at 2230 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Come on over and enjoy warm cookies with friends while doing your banking at Old National Bank. Old National Bank, member FDIC, equal housing lender. Adam's Place is tailored to you. Well, I'm on the salt free diet, so they're very good, Dale. And exercise? Well, I do a lot of walking. I have a bad back. Peggy Cunningham invites you to just come on and live with us. Hi, this is Terry Deal at Adams Place. Call me for more information about Adams Place. Phone 615-904-9111. On Memorial. Across from Walmart. The Action Line on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna. Listen and watch at WGNSRadio.com. This morning on the air with us, we have Joey P., president and CEO of Murfreesboro Medical Clinic. But a lot of people know MMC is MMC instead of the whole Murfreesboro Medical Clinic. And Surgery Center. Don't forget that part. And Surgery Center. (laughs) Do a lot of people just know it as MMC and think that's all there is to it, MMC? Uh, I I think that's some of it, Scott. But also uh, what I've always heard is the clinic. You know, where do you go to the doctor? Well, I go to the clinic. And people know what that is. Now, with the growth in the community, that's, that's, that's less and less uh, effective initially for some of those folks. But being known 
generically as as the clinic is is something that we've we've earned over 75 years again being the the largest provider of physician services in the community is is huge have you noticed a push by insurance companies to literally push patients towards a nurse practitioner a physician assistant versus first pushing them towards a regular doctor in order to save money i, I don't know that i would necessarily see it uh, as as a push by insurance companies i think what you're seeing in medicine is the growth of those advanced practice providers the pas the nps and other app's just because you can't find enough physicians and again i think about I mentioned we had nine internists when I started. We just started three NPs in the internal medicine department. Now with our 24 or so physicians in our internal family medicine department, we probably have 30 uh, NPs or PAs that that help support their practices. Now in the state of Tennessee, uh, there are limitations on the ability of those individual nurse practitioners or PAs to go out and set up their own shop. They, they have to have a certain level of physician supervision. So, you know, they may contract or actually employ a physician so that they can do that. But uh, it is sometimes opportunities to get patients in just because you don't have enough physician capacity. Uh, we, we as a group have chosen not to impanel patients to our NPs or PAs uh, to be seen at our, at our organization. You, you ultimately have to have a primary care physician again in the uh, in, in the internal family medicine department, for instance. That is truly your PCP, and then they're supported by the NPs or PAs, as the case may be. Have work ethics changed over the years for doctors, or is there just more paperwork so they have to work differently? What what has changed out there? Well. I don't know that I would say work ethic. What I would say is the work expectations of especially newer physicians when 40 years ago that internist was all things to everybody. They would maybe sitting at dinner, they get a call, and the next thing you know they're getting up and rushing to the hospital. Uh, Now with the advent of hospitalists, very few primary care physicians actually go and round on their patients. There's a few still do, but uh, that was something that helped their lifestyle. Uh, that train wreck that they get a call in the middle of the day, you you may have an appointment and your physician gets called to the hospital to, to go take care of a very sick patient and you're left sitting in the waiting room. We, we all love that, right? <laughs> uh, but at the same time, a, a younger generation, and it's just not in medicine, it's, it's people want more of a work-life balance now than what people would be willing to accept uh, many years ago. And I, I think of myself and in in what I did when I was early in my career and sacrificed time away from my family when when I was in public accounting uh the same with a lot of physicians but you know that's one of the things that that led me to come back to Murfreesboro to lead MMC the the fortunate to have some flexibility to be able to go to my kids sporting events or dance performances or whatever it is I had with my kids growing up Physicians are no different. They, they want to be able to go home and have dinner with their children and put them to bed and have some pajama time with their kids. So I don't know that I would say it's a work ethic uh, issue. I just think it's a cultural shift that's happened in this country of people seeking, and I'll use the air quotes, work-life balance, and physicians are no exception to that rule. Uh, the paperwork issue is, is, is a real thing that leads to a lot of burnout. Uh, the documentation methods I think we talked about earlier. It's just, it's it's more onerous on the physicians that does take time away from their time at home. How do you provide a better work-life balance to these doctors that you hire? Because, uh, you know, in the bigger picture, a lot of that balance is set by the practice they work for. Well, that's the beauty of being an independent practice because they, to a large degree, set their own schedule, how many patients they want to see, what time they want to start. That's the autonomy that an independent practice gives them. You go back to those 77% of physicians in the country that are employed, it's a lot almost like shift work at a factory where you're expected to see this many patients a day, and if you don't, then 
consequences are going to be there uh, in some way, shape, or form. But and and there's consequences in ours as well. You see fewer patients, your your income's probably not going to be where it is. Somebody seeing a couple more patients a day, but that's the best thing that we offer them is the autonomy to really set their own schedules. I'm sure there's a lot of advantages to working for a company like MMC versus being an independent doctor at their own private practice. Well, the the regulatory burden has gotten to the point where you're going to see fewer and fewer and fewer individual practices. Even even for those physicians that are retiring, there's nobody coming in to just take over their practice. As you know, used to, it was somebody would hang out their shingle practice for 40 years, and then they'd find some young physician coming out of training, bring them in for a couple of years, and then sell the practice to them. That you're seeing that less and less now just because of the the regulatory burden of running a business. Uh, my, I had a former CFO that would talk to physicians said, you can do that, but then you have two jobs, your practice owner and physician, and one of those you're trained for. At MMC, you've got folks who they specifically handle billing. They specifically handle insurance concerns or calls. They, I, I mean, you've got somebody that fills each of these positions, whereas a private practice it may be you who's a doctor and a secretary. Uh, it could be. You know, typically the funny thing I, I used to share is, yeah, you, you can eliminate cost in, an, in, a, in a small practice. You can't eliminate roles. So you don't have to have an HR person in your practice. You don't have to have an accountant in your practice. But you can't eliminate those roles. So what that means is the physician and his spouse and their kids may be sitting at the kitchen table on Sunday night stuffing envelopes to send out their statements. Again, the hourly rate for that stinks compared to what a physician ought to be making when they're, when they're doing those types of activities. Being in a group like MMC, you know, they do have executive leadership. We do have operations people, HR, IT, you know, in private practice. The physician's 14-year-old son may be their IT department. Yeah. So it's it's just all of those demands are what's making an individual practice just less and less frequent. During COVID, I think we saw online medicine to some degree really expand, and that may include online visits where you're meeting with a physician almost face-to-face. You're doing it through something similar to could be anything from Google Voice or or Zoom Zoom. that that people are seeing now or Microsoft Teams. That's actually an improvement that came out of COVID that is still in use today. There are the potential that those will stop getting approved and thus they will go away. But that that was actually an improvement in medicine that came out of COVID and we're still doing some of those. Not every visit's suitable for a virtual visit like that, but uh, there's some things, especially on some rechecks, that, that can be accomplished through a, uh, through a virtual visit, whether that be, be a, some type of teleconference or uh, a phone call. So that may not be here to last. That, that's correct. Uh, there, there's, there are pushes legislatively at Medicare levels and things about whether or not they're going to continue to approve that. So far, it's sticking around, and we hope it does. Uh, what would be the reason for eliminating something like that? Uh, money. That if you think about prior to covid uh, physicians were not reimbursed for telephone visits, okay? So then you take a, take a situation where now we're paying for those visits. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's some abuse of that uh, in, in certain situations, but if every time the, our Congress gets back together and saying Medicare costs are too high, what can we do to, to decrease those costs? As well, this is something we didn't do previously. Let's cut this back out. I know one of the concerns that some patients have whenever they go to the doctor is, am I going to have to do a battery of tests that cost a lot of money that lead me nowhere? Yeah, it's it's the uncertainty about doctor's visits or hospital visits or anything on the medicine side and and understanding the um, reasoning why those tests. And I'll use myself for an example. There was some lab test that came back abnormal for me. And so my physician was putting me through the ringer. He sent me to this specialist and that specialist. And, and, and finally, it turned out to be nothing that I couldn't change by just not taking as much Advil. And, yeah. and, and so it wasn't until I finally said, okay, what, what, what are we trying to do here and, and, and learning? So don't be afraid to ask, ask your physician questions about, okay, why do we need this test? What are, what are we trying to find here? And, and just so you are engaged in your care. And I guess it seems like, and this is probably true, there's a lot more tests out there to conduct 
than ever before. I mean, you, you didn't used to have the availability of all these different types of, of ultrasounds, the MRIs. I mean, there's just a lot out there. Well, as we were talking earlier, the driver right now in healthcare costs are the biologics, the drugs, the pharmaceuticals. And we, we were chatting off air about just the prevalence of advertisements that you see on television for some new drug and the uh, Ozempics and Mongernos and things that people are using for weight loss now that th- there was a shortage of those drugs a couple years ago that diabetic patients that were using those drugs effectively to control their their diabetes couldn't get them because of the prevalence of the use of them for for weight loss purposes and those are not inexpensive drugs and and so when when people are looking to pay that pay for those those have been you know very helpful to people help them lose weight help control their diabetes but they're not cheap and 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 so when those are covered by insurance again it's it's driving up cost again joey p with us this morning president and ceo of murphy's bro medical clinic and we're already out of time but as we close this morning the next new building you're going to be building is going to be next to west lawn or adjacent to west lawn and then one after that last casses that's correct and uh, I, w- I would remind everybody 70 75th anniversary we're hosting a business after hours next tuesday the 12th and uh, invite the business community out to that. It will be at our West Lawn location on Shores Road. Sounds great. Well, thank you for joining us. Scott, thank you for having me. Appreciate what you do. Stay with us. More local news on the way with WGNS's Ron Jordan.